Let's take a brief look at how we can prepare data for the training of speech recognition systems. At the bare minimum, what your system is going to ask for is the name of the WAV files, of the sound files that contain your audio, and the transcription of the words in the audio files. This is an example from the training of the Cook Islands Maori speech recognition system. The program called Deep Speech required a CSV with three columns, the name of the WAV files, the size of the files, and the transcript. And these are the words in Cook Islands Maori in each of these files. What we had uh, before we did this was a big file called Jane 2012, which had a long interview in it. And we chopped it up so that each small bit corresponds to just a sentence, for example. And we could chop it up because we had it in a format that was time aligned, as you'll see here. We had it in a format where, where we knew that the file chain 2012 contained the phrase the opening idea of the between 4.1 seconds and 4.9 seconds, which you can see in the spectrogram here from 4.1 to approximately 4.9. So by the way, this is the format for a different software called Favaline. And as you can see, it demanded another uh, type of file with these four columns, the file, the transcription, the end, the beginning and the end time for the transcription. So out of these, the program is going to try to learn what is it about the spectrogram of an A that makes it an A. So it's going to try to learn what is it about this A and this A that makes them similar, but also makes them different from this E and this E and this other E right here. Uh, the, the computer is going to try to learn that, and then when it hears a new recording, it's going to try to offer the output of, oh, this slice of the spectrogram corresponds to A, or this slice of the spectrogram corresponds to E for example. This sounds really neat. However, in many languages, the orthography or the writing system doesn't really represent the phones. It represents a more abstract uh, unit like phonemes, or it, the relationship between writing and sound is opaque, like in Chinese characters. In English, for example, the sequence read could be spelled as R-E-A-D, or R-E-E-D, for example. Because what we get out of the system is phones, and what we need is the orthographic representation, we need some sort of middle file that can join this one and this one. And we're going to call this a pronunciation dictionary. A pronunciation dictionary would have the orthographic forms, and then the pronunciation forms described with some sort of system for the forms of the language. There's a very important one for English called the CMU dictionary that uses a system called ARPABET. This is Ar ARPABET for English. It describes the phones of English, as you can see here. So it has a AA for bot, but AE for bat. And it also tells you about the levels of stress. So the stressed syllables of primary stress are one and zero are syllables with no stress. So as you can see here, for example, the word vowels is V, A, uh, uh, and then A-H, zero, uh, vowels, for example. The word digits is digits, the word uh, following is following. So the CMU dictionary is made of two columns, essentially, the words in English and their phone representation and in ARPABET. And what the speech recognition system needs to do is figure out which of the phones that it deciphered correspond to the phone representations for words of English. And once it has matched one of these, it will retrieve the orthographic representation of the word in English. And it will do the same for any language where the orthography is not um, 
transparent, actually any language, because all languages have difficulties when representing the sounds of the language. Even Spanish would need one like these. One interesting feature of ARPABET is that it, it was made in Silicon Valley. It was made in the western part of the U.S., so it does not represent every dialect of even American English. For example, caught and caught, which are merged in the West, are only represented as one vowel in this system, but the AO. There's no way to represent the contrast that people have in this region between cut and caught. So there's no, really no alphabet way to represent this one, and yet this, this is the system that is used in most representations of American English. So even there, so there's some bias for you. It's difficult to prepare data, and we need a lot of it. How much depends on what you want to do. Maybe you only want to recognize 10 words of the language, in which case you only need a couple of hundreds of these for the uh, system to learn them correctly. Maybe you wanted to recognize every word of English, in which case it's going to need a very large set of data so that it can hear thousands of words at least once. Maybe you want the system to work with just one speaker or many speakers. And the, and the more general you want the system to be, the more data you will need for it to learn to identify all the possible variations of sounds. Um, very important, does your data represent the population you want to recognize? So biases obviously enter here. For example, maybe the only data you can get is from newscasts, but you want to recognize colloquial speech, which is never present in your training set. So you're going to have problems here. Maybe they're all newscasts from the west of the United States. So you're never going to get speech from the eastern and southern parts of the United States. One example from Cook Islands Maori is that it's obviously easier to get recordings from younger people but the, the recordings we really want to transcribe are from older people because they're the storytellers and they know the genealogies of the island. And so it's been very difficult to get good training data to transcribe this data. So you need to make sure that the data you train on and the data you're trying to decipher are, to transcribe are roughly similar. In general, you need a lot of training data. Uh, there's a English corpus called TIMIT, which is usually uh, used to benchmark speech recognition systems. It has uh, 1,300 transcriptions, uh, utterances from 168 speakers. So this is hundreds of thousands of uh, transcribed utterances. Industrial systems use millions of utterances and take days to train. Uh, when we were training the Maori models with Aotearoa Maori, this took the AWS um, cloud computers literally days on the best servers that, that we could get. And by the way, the more data you have, the better your model will be, which is why Google and Amazon um, are all really trying to get devices into your home that can listen to you and can capture your speech because with all of the data they capture, they can continue to improve and improve their models. In summary, we need to provide at least two sources of data for the system, the recordings and the transcriptions of the recordings. Depending on our language, we're probably also going to need something like a pronunciation dictionary that can match the phones that we get from the, sig from the audio signal with an orthographic representation. And in order for the computer to learn what the what spectrographic features correspond to which phones, the system is going to need a lot of data. Lots of data, like millions of transcribed um, sentences and hours and hours of data before it can begin to give you results. The absolute minimum that people have, have managed to work with is four to five hours for traditional systems. With 10 hours of data, you will begin to get, uh, you know, not terrible results from traditional systems. And end-to-end -end systems, which we'll look at next, need thousands, if not tens of thousands of hours for them to recognize speech.